meeting is a continuation of one that we we did back in April. I'm sorry, in May of last year, in 2023. So we're calling this the Investors Toolkit Two, and uh, this will be a continuation of several of the items. Let's see here. I, I'm going to have to try to negotiate this screen. I'm having a little tough time here. There we go. So the first five five items last year we talked about the first five tools how to establish an asset allocation, how to test it, how to choose a mutual fund, how to create an investment plan, IPS, and how to use a spreadsheet to maintain your portfolio. We had quite a few tools that were constructed. And I, the feeling I got after I gave that presentation, or I think it was well liked, well appreciated, was it was a little overwhelming for folks. So I, I took that in mind. And uh, I'd like to refer those of you who have not been to it if you have any interest in creating an IPS or using a spreadsheet to maintain your portfolio, uh, you should go back and revisit this. Uh, and I can, if you if you have access to our website, the Sacramento Bogleheads website, which is sacramentoareabogleheads.org, uh, you can pick up the presentation slides, just go to the archive and look for the May meeting. Uh, you can also get the actual presentation, a recording of that, on our Bogleheads uh, YouTube site. So uh, the YouTube site, I think it's, it's Sacramento Bogleheads. I think probably the best way to, to get there is uh, simply to uh, Google it and it will come up. There's also a, another Bogleheads site that some other chapters use, but ours says very clearly Sacramento Bogleheads. And that is meeting number 97. So today we're gonna talk about how to calculate your personal rate of return year to year to date and year over year, how to evaluate two or more different portfolios using a tool called Portfolio Visualizer. And finally, we're gonna to just touch on how to reach financial independence using Mr. Money Mustache Chart. And the reason we're just gonna to touch on it is because we've actually already talked about this in December. And if you're one of those who are listening to this presentation on our YouTube channel, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, there was no presentation given in December, so you're going to have to just basically visit the Money Mustache site and read the article that we're talking about because we, we have not released anything for the month of December on YouTube. And then there's a couple of other items that I'm going to touch on, uh, how to construct a safe withdrawal rate for retirement, uh, how the markets work, and I'll, I'll discuss those when we get there. Yeah, I think the, the first thing I'd like to talk about as a way to introduce the uh, number six here, which is how to calculate your personal rate of return, is why would you want to know your personal rate of return? Now, I think there's some several good reasons. A couple of people before this meeting began mentioned that, you know, maybe they didn't want to know what it was. Uh, I think it's kind of nice, if only just to compare uh your, your returns and how much your particular portfolio is making, if it's a lot like a, an existing benchmark, then you'll have a pretty easy uh, way to compare it and to know whether you're earning that money. One thing I discovered a number of years ago when I was um, investing into retirement accounts is that my retirement account didn't often match, the, the rate of return didn't match the S&P 500, even though that's the type of fund that I was invested in. And what I determined, and it took a while to, to uh, figure this out, is that the costs were not being reflected on the statement that I was getting. And so the, re the returns were suffering in comparison to uh, what, what you'd find on a regular S&P 500 index fund. So that's one reason is, you know, you want to you check its honesty. Make sure that you're on the right track. If you have, if your portfolio is so unusual, or you have items that, that are uh, causing a drag on performance. It's nice to know that. It's nice to make early and mid course corrections. In other words, to make those changes before too many years goes by. And you can do that. And that one element of that one aspect is the personal rate of return. So I've got this information. Uh, these are basically modified screens from Jim Dolly's site. That's the white coat investor. Uh, and that's why some of these dates may surprise you at being a little long in the tooth from 2007 to 2011. But I'm going to try to step through this uh, so that you have some understanding of how to take his spreadsheet, his good explanations, good instructions for this stuff, 
and uh, make it your own. Now, these are examples. So if you have a, a, a portfolio with say four over four or five different accounts and with lots of uh, withdrawals or contributions, you're someone who contributes uh, several times a week or whenever you feel like it, you may find that doing your own XIRR rate of return calculation to be a bit onerous because this is really designed, I think more easily done uh, for those who just contribute once a month or if you're taking out to you know to do your withdrawal say once a month or once every few months. Um, otherwise, you're just really dealing with too many lines. Now the even though it's not displayed, the first column here that says cash flow and balance, that's column A and the date code, that's column B. So I've just highlighted things here that I thought would be helpful in, let me just zoom in a little bit. Uh, in, in understanding this, I'm not gonna take you through every single calculation, obviously. Uh, it's called XIRR, what is that? That's a, basically an Excel function or a spreadsheet function. It's an iterative calculator, means it takes the results, you feed it to guess, and, it, and does the calculation again, it's trying to be more and more precise. Computers can do things a lot faster than we can, fortunately, and so this is a very doable, uh, uh, very doable in, in with a modern computer. Uh, doing so by paper is possible, but that would be uh, rather difficult, and I don't know any, why anyone would. And there is a uh, an XIRR function in Google Sheets, and there's also in in using if you're using Mac uh, it, within the Numbers program. I'm not sure if it's called something different. I think it's called the same thing. And it basically stands for internal rate of return. Why is the personal rate of return that we're talking about here different than a rate of return you might see uh, if you're looking for uh, at a prospectus or if you're looking at a particular stock or a mutual fund? Well, that's fairly easy. The Those, those returns, the rate of return, the one year, five year, 10 year, whatever, for a mutual fund, or another type of investment, they're not talking about your investment. They, they're not gonna reflect uh, withdrawals or distributions from the fund uh, as well uh, as you'll be able to do with the XIRR. Uh, so if your S&P 500 fund uh, that you wanna buy at Vanguard or Schwab or wherever is earning say 10% in a particular year, that doesn't mean that you're gonna earn 10%. Uh, you may earn more than that. You may earn less than that, depending on when you, uh, depending on cash flows, basically. So the way this works is the first entry is sort of the the rollover uh, balance. It's the starting balance, and here it's five thousand dollars. You can see that in column A, and Excel and I assume numbers is a sim equivalent or similar. They put a date code in there because the date is represented internally by the computer. So in Excel, you say equal date, this is a function by itself, open paren, year, month, day, and then close paren. And if you type that in here and, and press the return key or the enter key, uh, it, will, it will display the date, but internally it will be stored so that the function IRR can work on it. And that's what we want. So these are just pretty much standard contributions. That, that's what you're looking for here. The cash flows are money that comes in or leaves the portfolio or whatever it is you're taking the XIR uh, for. Uh, I think if you do it on a portfolio basis, that's a lot easier than if you do it by account or certainly uh, by fund, because that could be, uh, it can lead to a lot of a lot of lines. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, one fortunate thing is you can add these together if you have uh, say a retirement account and a, a brokerage account, and you have a couple of times a month, you put in a little money in each, you can combine them if they're on the same day, if we're talking about the same portfolio. Now here we have $500 on the first, uh, I'm sorry, on the 2nd of January. Here's another contribution on J July 28th, another one, $3,000 on October. Now notice this, this goes for several years and he's doing that for a reason, which I'll discuss in a moment. Here's a withdrawal. And I just put this in red to make it obvious. You, you can format it so that it's in a parens, so it's colored red, it just has a minus sign, whatever works for you. And this first example is the simplest. Here's some more contributions down here. And finally, this is the only, the only thing you really have to know about. When you're done on the last day or the day that you wish to 
uh, run the uh, internal rate uh, rate of return calculation, you need to put in the ending balance as a minus amount. That's why it says minus $15,000. Uh, that's just the way the, the function works. And here is the actual function, and this is what is typed into that function. XIRR, open paren, and then it shows a couple of of uh, ranges here, A5 through A15, B5 through B15. So that would be here through all the way here. And then on the second column here, all the way here. And it takes that and the 10% is just a guess. Uh, typically you could put in one or five or 10%, whatever it is you think it might be. And that's just the way, that's just the way that this particular function works. So you don't have to worry about this too much. I, I almost put in 10% for everything that I do that has to do with returns. And so if it's low, that's fine. If it's high, you just want to give it somewhere to start. And this return right here is called an annualized return. You notice it's 8.85%. That, that's the entire period from July 11th, 2007, all the way to May 11th. Uh, I'm sorry, May 19th in, in 2011. This uh, is a much more complicated uh, well, not much more complicated, but somewhat more complicated, using um, a, a few different ways to derive, uh, to help the internal rate of return function derive some different figures and for different purposes. The last one gave us a, a, a internal, internal rate of return calculation for four years, basically, from 07 uh, through, uh, through 2011. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide and I'm gonna come back to this one. Uh, the only thing I want you to notice here is that it starts off with the same thing, the end of year negative balance, the end of year positive balance. Here's a withdrawal, end of year negative, end of year positive. This is simply a, uh, a structure, a, a, way to, a way to do this so that the calculation comes out correctly. This, this here, there's an end of year balance. And finally you end up with the minus 15,000 as a negative number. Now, this is what you're, you'll be able to do uh, with this particular example, a little more complicated. By using two entries, the first negative and the second positive for the end of the year, you're able to get a different type of, uh, of return function. For example, on the 2007 return, that would be starting on July 11th through the end of the year, you notice that this is a little more complicated the way you capture that because it's not a full year. The full years are pretty straightforward. Type in XIRR, the range that it applies to. In this case, 2008 from A3 to A9, and we go back here, A3 to A9. So it starts with the first positive at the end of the year for the prior year through the end of the year negative. So you see with the range that it's capturing. Uh, and then it does some, well, it does a, 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 on 2007, it actually gets a date, uh, calculates the date, the difference in the dates in order to capture the number of days of the year we're talking about. And it does that with uh, date minus date divided by 365. You don't really have to worry too much about this, but this will give you a partial year. Uh, this is straightforward, I think. This, this range here that it's doing A10 through A14, B10 through B14, same thing. These are the columns, A10. So it starts at the positive for an end of the year positive, and it should go to the end of the year negative. I said 14, so that would be, here's the end of the year negative. Now you don't have to worry about positive or negative balance. Just make sure you have the structure that comes closest to this, uh, that the end of the year always has a negative and a positive except for the, the final balance. And then you can make these things work. And here's, here's one for an annualized return for 2011 and a year to date return. Notice there's the, the same calculation for date here. You don't really have to worry about that. You just put the, the date in, uh, the final date is May 19th, 2011. And you're gonna subtract out the previous uh, end of year date and then this calculation, and then, so this tells you the year to date is, uh, as of May 11th is, or May 19th, is only 0.38%, 38 basis points. I hope that's clear. 
And there are some, uh, in case I was a little bit muddy with my instructions, there are a number of instructions here. And I think this is fairly straightforward, if, especially if, you, uh, if you're just looking for uh, a particular rate of return, a personal rate of return for the current year, over multiple years, or for a partial year, something fairly straightforward. Uh, here are the instructions down here and the in the URL. It's called how to calculate a dollar weighted return formula in Excel. If you don't have access to the uh, that URL or you can't type it in, uh, you can just do a a, a um, Google search for that, and I'm sure it'll come up. It's the White Coat Investors site. Uh, Greg. Yeah. Bert's got a question. He's got his hand up. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Bert. <laughs> okay. Set on mute. Has some things going on. Uh, just want to make one comment was that people are, aren't that familiar with Excel or anyway, spreadsheets in general. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to make sure they know that the date has to be in what's called a date format. You know, you, when you put an entry into a cell, you have to tell it what kind of information it is, like if it's a number, and what the format is. For a date, you have to do the same thing in order for the spreadsheet to actually calculate with it. If you, do, if you put it in, in a text format, it won't know what to do with it. That's right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. That is correct. You've got to be a little bit specific with this. And this 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 example is try, trying to make it, trying to explain it, and at the same time, trying to make it very, very easy. Um, so the closer you, you know, it's like anything else. If you don't understand something, follow the example, look at the instructions again and see if that, see if that works. Thank you, Bert. Yeah, I, I don't think I need to belabor this any longer uh, because you don't have to worry about the colors, obviously. And this is just highlighting the different aspects of it. If you think about using your portfolio, what kind of entries go in the in this particular calculation? It's anything withdrawals that leave your portfolio or additions, contributions that go into it. So you don't have to worry about dividends, reinvested dividends or capital gains, unless if you make the sale, obviously that would be down here, like that would on uh, October of 2008, that would be a withdrawal if you decide to uh, cash out some of your stock or or for that matter, just take out cash. If it actually leaves the portfolio, then that, that becomes an entry. Okay, how do you think I did, Bert? Do you, you wanna add something? No, okay. Uh, like I say, there are instructions here and my, uh, the thought is here to introduce the basic stuff and see if we can, see if, see if that makes sense for you. And if not, then, well, we can have another meeting and just talk about that one spreadsheet. But I didn't want to belabor it too long. Uh, I think the Jim Dolly, the, the white coat investor, is a pretty good teacher uh, in that he keeps examples much more clean than I would if I was doing it. So our next item that we're going to talk about is number seven, how to evaluate two or more different portfolios using Portfolio Visualizer. Uh, now, this tool is an online tool. You can see the... Uh, URL right here, portfoliovisualizer.com. It is, since I first looked at it a number of years ago, it's gotten very complex. Part of it is um, uh, pay, pay as you go. And the parts that I'm interested in, I didn't see anybody asking me for any money. So I don't think there's any charge that goes with this. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay. This is a little better, I guess. Uh, we're not seeing everything in here. This is just the front page. There's backtest portfolio, factor analysis, asset analytics. Most of this stuff, I don't personally find a use for, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of different tools within this one website. And so what we'd like to talk about today in, in a little bit of detail is the asset allocation overview. So let's suppose that you are want, would like to backtest your existing portfolio or a, a proposed portfolio, something that you've uh, uh, thought about doing and would like to know how it's done in the past. Because obviously there is no calculator that's gonna tell you how something is gonna do in the future. So this tool is basically look at the past and see if you can come up with some ideas for this. And, uh, and I'm gonna walk through the tool, how I would use it and how I've used it for these examples. Um, 
I'm not going to go over every one portfolio view. I've only used list view. I assume there's table view. I know you can download it um, into an Excel file, uh, but we're going to we're going to play it very simple here. We're going to use the time period year to year and the start of this. I think this is the earliest start date. You can go back to 1972. So if you have investments that predate 1972, I think with this tool you're out of luck. Someone could correct me if I'm if I'm incorrect. And of course, it goes through current. So the, the tool uh, suggests that a starting initial amount of $10,000, obviously you can customize this to whatever you want. Uh, cash flows, in this particular example, there's none. It just rebalances annually. So you could actually select an asset class with these pull downs here and, and set up any number of portfolios and a, and a benchmark, which is not shown here, but it will be on the next screen and come up to a lot of interesting conclusions. And what we're trying to do is emulate um, a portfolio. And so for this first emulation, I've got two here. We're gonna start in the year 2000, that's the start year. So it's just a pop down or a pop in box. I forgot what you call them, pop, pop something. <laughs> they, they appear on your screen and you type in the, in the number or choose the number. So we're gonna go for a 24 year period. And we have initial amount of $1,000. That's our starting balance. We're going to contribute a fixed amount. There are, there are different uh, different possibilities there. You can contribute once a year or do withdrawals once a year, uh, and any amount there. And this is this is important because this two thousand dollars is controlled by the contribution frequency, which is monthly. So what I'm imagining here with adding two thousand dollars a month to the portfolio is. I'm thinking of a 401k contribution currently is 23,000 maximum uh, plus another thousand dollars a year to make it 24,000 divided by 12 to 2,000. I figure this is a pretty common uh, investment amount. Uh, contribution frequency I already mentioned this is monthly and we're going to inflation adjust that contribution. The rebalance annually. Yes, we'd like to do that. Uh, here's the benchmark that I chose. Now you have a number of benchmarks that you could choose and you can actually create a custom benchmark. Uh, this is basically what the comparison is to. If you don't enter a, uh, a other portfolios down there, you're comparing your portfolio or one you select to the benchmark, which is the, in this case, the Vanguard Balance Index Fund. And if I'm not mistaken, that is a 60-40, meaning 60% 60 stocks and 40% bond fund uh, or blend fund. Some people call it blend. So I've actually given our portfolio a name in this exercise to call it Sacramento Area Bogleheads. And I've decided for an 80-20 allocation, and you can see down below how I've split it up. You can type anything you want down here. So the, these pull down menus allow you to select from various asset classes, everything US stocks or REITs or what have you. So in this one, the first example is gonna be rather simple. The US stock 60%, I think foreign stocks or global XUS, 20% and bonds, 20%. So 60 and 20 is 80% equities or stocks, 20% is the bond allocation. Now we can also go on and add other portfolios to get a bigger picture. You can actually create a custom portfolio to upload, or you can pick out one of these sample portfolios and they have just about everything. If you consider yourself a conservative, they you can look at that, an income portfolio. They've got portfolios um, favored by various uh, folks in the past, Bill Bernstein, Bill Schultz. They've got the Boglehead three fund and four fund portfolios here. They've got the David Swenson Yale Endow Endowment, his portfolio that he used at uh, Yale University. Uh, the ultimate buy and hold even got a permanent portfolio uh, and a Larry Swedro one to round it out. So there, you have a number of choices there, and, and I find these kind of fascinating. So let's continue with the example here. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pick my 80-20. We've already talked about how I've devised that. 60% US stock, 20% foreign, 20% bond. And then I picked out a couple of other photo, uh, uh, excuse me, portfolios that are sort of similar. The Bill Schultz size coffee house portfolio, a 60-40, and a Bill Bernstein no-brainer. Not sure what book that came out of. Uh, and that one is a 75-25. Notice <coughs> that I'm all- trying to get on good footing this year, and then I'll do it next year, you know? 
I'm sorry, someone's talking, but I can't hear what you're saying. Okay, I'm going to continue. Uh, so the 80% stock, 75% stock, or 60% stock portfolios, they're, they're rather different in how they're constructed. The coffeehouse portfolio, its biggest holding is U.S. bonds at 40%. And everything else is divided up into 10%. Uh, has foreign stocks, large cap value, large cap, small cap value, small cap, and REITs. So what we can say about that immediately is that this is a, uh, it, it's kind of tilted toward foreign stocks and large cap value and small cap value. So you could call this a small value tilt, I guess. Uh, number three is Bill Bernstein's portfolio. And in spite of the fact that it's split up, I'm sorry, on portfolio number two, it's still a 60-40 portfolio, meaning it's got a, a pretty good uh, percentage of bonds in it. So it's a little more conservative than the 80-20. And here we have one that kind of splits the difference. One of Bill Bernstein portfolios, he talks about 25% in four different asset classes, and that's the entire portfolio. Global, ex-US stock market, that's foreign, total US bond, US large cap, US small cap. And this, once you press the you know uh, analysis or press the return key, and remember, we're doing analysis for 24 years from January 2000 to a little longer than 24 years to March 2024. And, and it gives you a nice visual pie chart for each of the portfolios and talks about how they're broken out. I guess you could save this. I haven't really experimented around with this. I don't think there's any need to save my own portfolio. But uh, suppose you would like a portfolio, you can go back up here to one of these things and, and save it to a hard drive or to a computer, I guess. Uh, here's the coffee house portfolio. You see that's much more of a slice and dice. And then there's Bill Bernstein's up here with his pie chart, which uh, if I just had to look at it, if he took the uh, asset categories away, I would say, oh, is that, that must be the... Uh, uh, could, could, could someone uh, work on the mute button for whoever's talking, please? And thank you. Um, so we've got four different sectors here. Uh, that's Bill Bernstein. Now, this is the performance summary. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit for this. So you see each of these portfolios. Uh, and it looks like after 24 years that I happen to have a, a, a pretty favored portfolio, $2.2 million. Second was the balance, Vanguard Balanced Index Fund. Then Bill Bernstein's and then the coffee house portfolio holding up the rear uh, earned uh, about half a million less. Uh, and then notice all the different, uh, we'll get into these on another uh, screen shortly, but we'll notice the here that there, the, there's compound annual growth and the winner in that, uh, the highest one is uh, obviously the portfolio that, that I favored. And it has the best year, the worst year, the max drawdown, uh, sharp and Sortino ratios. Uh, basically, this indicates the um, distance from a standard deviation so that the, the higher the number here, the better it is, uh, mostly for, um, uh, I, I've lost the thought, but usually the higher numbers are the better ones. So 42 is not a very high sharp ratio for this particular portfolio. The ba ba balanced uh, index fund is at, 0 0.50, that's a little better. And of course the coffee house portfolio is even a better sharp ratio and yet, so less risky in other words. And and yet uh, if you had to look at this portfolio, it, assuming that it all happened in the past, uh, I'm not sure which one I would pick because I looking at the balance index portfolio and the numbers are very favorable here. The drawdowns are only like 32% compared to 42% with uh, the portfolio that I designed. Uh, that doesn't seem real real good. In other words, you may, may not be getting the uh, your bang for your buck as far as risk. Uh, but nevertheless, risky or not, and this, this is definitely not um, a, uh, a, a clear picture of what I did. The next one is a little bit closer. And so we're gonna go to, on to a second example here. Well, we will if I can get the slide to move. 
There we go. Okay, so what, what we're doing now is we're starting again with a slightly different portfolio. The reason I wanted to start again is I, after doing the previous exercise, I thought I'd like to know what uh, more of the uh, like to see more of the performance and and report results, and I wanted it to conform a little bit to what I actually uh, to the portfolio that I hold today. And I'm I'm the presenter in this, so this is kind of my portfolio. If I had applied what I know today back to, for the last 21 years, so the start year is 2003. And I plan to compare it to Boglehead's four fund portfolio and Swedro's simple portfolio. Draw off with $1,000. I've increased the contribution amount. This is uh, basically a, uh, uh, if you're a uh, W-2 wage earner, uh, you, this would be a, a maximum a contribution to a 401k, 23,000 this year and about 7,000 uh, for an IRA or a, a Roth IRA. So you put that together, that's 30,000 divided by 12. 12 months, 2,500 a month. Contribution frequently uh, frequency is uh, monthly rebalancing. Uh, I changed that as well. Instead of just rebalancing once a year, I'd like to rebalance the way I do today, which is basically certain asset categories, such as stocks or bonds, drift away from my, my preferred asset allocation. So if I want my, my stocks to be 80% and it drops down below 75%, or goes past 85% on the high side, then I make a change. I try to, I try to make, fix that asset allocation by um, selling and, and buying uh, or doing an exchange inside of a retirement account, uh, which is usually what I do. Uh, this tells you the, uh, the absolute deviation, the relative deviation, uh, same benchmark. And here we've got the four, I mean, excuse me, the three funds I'm comparing to that benchmark the presenter, that's me, the Bull Red Four Fund, and Larry Swedro's Simple Portfolio. And here it are, 80-20, um, and Larry uh, Swedro's uh, portfolio turns out to be 60-40. So this may not look correct for this first portfolio, but this actually reflects my current IPS. And I have 35% in large cap, and by the way, that's, that's not of stocks, that's of the entire portfolio, which my may explain why it looks the way it does. There's 5%, I've decided to go to mid cap, 9% to small, uh, international XUS, that means foreign stocks not included in the United States. Emerging markets, 5%, REITs, five, those are domestic REITs, by the way. Total US bond market, international bonds, 4% of the portfolio. And finally, the short-term investment grade, which covers a lot of things for, for me because I have everything from um, I bonds to CDs to uh, high yield savings accounts, as well as a number of short term uh, bond like um, uh, funds, mutual funds in my uh, brokerage account and in my uh, retirement account. So that uh, that total is about 6%. Uh, so this is my target portfolio, basically. And it comes out to 80 20. You're just going to have to trust me on that. <laughs> uh, and the portfolio, too, is the, the famous Boglehead 4 Fund, which is sort of a derivative from something that Taylor Larimore came up with a number of years ago. He's kind of famous with the 3 Fund portfolio. This is the 4 Fund. Uh, and this particular one, it adds 10% tips and 10% bonds. So it's, a, it's also an 80-20 portfolio. The stocks all come from 50% U.S. stock and foreign stock here to tally to 100%. The last one is Larry Swedro's simple portfolio, a little more conservative since it only has 60% in stocks and equities. So he has 13%. His, his largest contribution is in uh, largest allocation is 40%, and that's in TIPS, um, the Treasury Inflation Protected Security. Uh, US small is 13, emerging markets four. Uh, then he is, looks like this is a value tilt. U.S. large cap value, small cap value at 15%. Oh, yeah. And this is the foreign value. So this is basically a value tilted portfolio, but a conservative one at that. And so we're not going to bounce through everything here. This is 
This is my slice and dice portfolio that I currently practice. Uh, by the way, I, my portfolio in actuality, even though we're going to look at numbers suggesting that I would have made so much money for the last 21 years, when I started investing, uh, everything was in large cap growth for a while. So th this doesn't really reflect what I did. This is sort of an idealized backward look. So there's my slice and dice portfolio compared to the much simpler, much more straightforward Boglehead 4 fund. And then we have Larry Swedro's portfolio here with that big, big slice of tips here and a number of other things. This is the value tilted portfolio. And finally, the performance summary, which I will try to zoom in on a little bit. There we are. Uh, so surprisingly, at least I was a little surprised, here again, uh, the final balance after 21 years of investment is $2,040,000. Uh, and what, there's a couple of others that are pretty close. The four fund did almost as much. And here's the compound annual growth rate. It's very, very close. The maximum drawdown also very close. Uh, you see the, the sharp ratio, 62, then 61, 90 for the Sortino, for the, for the Boglehead 4 fund. The only uh, portfolio that sticks out here for me is the one that earned the least, but may have been, you know, it looked like a fine portfolio. It's off by a couple of hundred thousand dollars, 300,000 perhaps, but it had pretty good uh, maximum drawdown figures. The worst year was 24%, minus 24. The Vanguard balance was minus 22. But you notice that the market correlation for Swedro's portfolio is a little weak. If you were invested in any of these other portfolios that we just dredged up, other, other than the Larry Swedro one, uh, you, were, you were closest to the market. Now, this could suggest, since Swedro was the underperformer here, this really could suggest that just the last 21 to 24 years have been an excellent time to be as close as possible to market returns. There may be other periods where that isn't necessarily so, that, that a, a portfolio like Larry Swedro's or some other unusual portfolio is actually superior. But uh, we're not going to know that. And you can get into this stuff, and, and they have little eye symbols. You can get more information on each of these items. Okay. Okay. And that, this basically is the bar graph of the various returns. I'm going to go in a little bit more. Uh, showing each of the portfolios. It's rather nice, the, these little graphs. Showing the annual returns. And notice, okay, remember that the, the 2022 was not a particularly good year. And the previous years that were just so-so, 2018, 2015, 2011, and 2008, of course, was the Great Recession. Um, started off with a good year here and had a few good times. This is just a reaction to the 2008, I think. And then some, annual, okay, let me zoom in here. Hold on. Okay. I think you can see this near the bottom here. This shows you the total return percentages, three month, year to date, one year, the annualized returns, and for the full period that we're evaluating. And look how close they are, 8.86 and 8.66 for the four fund. You really, I have really nothing bad to say about the Boglehead four fund, at least if the three and four fund Boglehead portfolios perform like they have for the last 20, 25 years in the future, then they're really the, it's really the place to be. Uh, I don't know, all the slicing and dicing that I do now, uh, I, I'm not sure that will get you much more. And you can, you can actually quantify how much more, at least for the past, And I just, okay, zoom in again. I just wanted to show you that there are many other examples of various things you can do with that portfolio. There's uh, portfolio modeling. That's what we just looked at. Uh, the back testing, asset allocation. You can pick specific funds. You can pick specific stocks as long as it has a ticker symbol. 
uh, you can look at a, a variety of interesting portfolios if you want to play around with it. And there's also some other um, similar tools in this toolbox that we're not we don't have time to go over today, but are interesting. There's Monte Carlo simulations, so you can see how long your money uh, is going to last, uh, or at least what the chances are with with so much and over such a long uh, re- short and long periods. There is various portfolio optimizations determining the final, the efficient frontier. I almost said final frontier. Sounds more like Star Trek. Uh, mean variance optimizing, uh, risk parity analysis, uh, constrained optimize. You can pick certain variables there and constrain them. Um, forward, forward-looking capital market expectations. I've never used that before. And finally, risk factor-based allocation. Uh, and you can do factor regression analysis. And I've never really messed around too much with uh, number four or five, uh, but they're all part of the same tool. The moving averages, relative strength, dual momentum, uh, target volatility, uh, that's what um, I think most people would call tactical asset allocation. Uh, I call it unnecessary, but that's just me. And here is the the name of this uh, particular effort, how to evaluate two or more portfolios. And here is the... URL to get there. And at the end, I'll pass out more. Uh, number eight, how to reach financial independence. We're, I had planned to talk about this in a little more detail, but we've already done so. In our December meeting, we covered this pretty well. And for those of you who uh, received the video, uh, it's in. Uh, there was a three-part video for December. And you can see this talked about in, in the part two, near the beginning of part two of that video. I think the, each, each segment's about an hour. And here is the, the name. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can simply Google the name and get the uh, uh, Mr. Money Mustache will come up. And I would suggest that's probably the only way you're gonna be able to, uh, you don't have access to the December uh, recording. So I would suggest that you just go to look at the article and read it because uh, it, it could be very uh, very exciting, very impactful. And here's the table that I put forward that impressed me so much. The bottom line is that if, you, if you're a crazy, crazy saver, you can retire in a very few number of years. If you're able, because of, uh, of earnings or because of you're in a dual income household or because you're a sacrificial saver, you've somehow figured out a way to reduce your expenses. Um, you can, if you can become retired or at least retired to something you really want to do uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. And this is another one I considered doing. This is how to construct a safe withdrawal rate for retirement. We have talked about this in recent years, but probably the the most uh, um, probably the longest and 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 probably most detailed analysis we did of this. Our presentation was given by David Burns um, a little more than five years ago, and it was called the Ultimate Guide to Safe Withdrawal Rates. So I thought I'd put the information here. I think what I uh, would hope is that David would be able to uh, revisit this at some point and give us a, a presentation on that. And I feel like I just wouldn't do it justice. There's also early retirement now spreadsheet, um, the safe withdrawal rate spreadsheet that he uh, introduced us to back five years ago. And I thought uh, this has been around for a while. There's an audio recording of that meeting where he actually does the presentation. And I thought this would be uh, acceptable to make this public at this time. Um, so th- this is the audio, rec- audio recording. We don't have a, a videotape of this. Uh, then there's Social Security Benefits Primer, and this is simply an add-on. It doesn't really have anything to do with safe withdrawal rate, but it might have something to do with your retirement planning, especially if you're if you're closing in, in your 60s. Um, so not everyone can t- will take or want to wait till 70 years old to take Social Security. Uh, for some people, it's advise they take it a, quite a bit earlier. Uh, but read the primer. It's only two pages. It's something I came up with years ago. And that, that's my cheat sheet. And basically, that's it. The presentation and the links to the tools uh, will be sent to participants, meeting participants. And that means you folks here today. So I'd like to thank you and take your questions.